networks abound all around us. We live in a network world. One cannot imagine a world without networks. This is an introductory course in computer networks where we aim to introduce you to the underlying concepts of computer networks. A solid understanding of these concepts will enable you to become better professionals and push your careers further. There are many types of networks, wide networks, fiber optic networks, wireless networks, etc. This course will focus on wired or cable networks. Welcome to Introduction to Computer Networks, Computers and Networks, CSIT 202. My name is Ferdinand Apietu Kachuku from the Computer Science Department. This first session will focus on the very basics, at the end of which you should be able to understand the physical connections needed for a computer to connect to the internet, recognize the components of a computer, install and troubleshoot uh, NICs and modems, configure the set of protocols needed for the internet connection, use basic procedures to test an internet connection, and demonstrate a basic ability to use web browsers and plugins. There are a few key terms that you need uh, to know. Uh, so I expect you to become familiar with these terms, and some of them are on the screen. In this session, I want to look at connecting to the internet, some network mathematics, some basic mathematics you need for the network. The reading list is shown on the screen. There are three main tests which we need you to look at. But a lot of the information too you can get on the internet. This session introduces the basic concepts and components of modern computer networks upon which most networks are built. This session also covers some of the related binary, decimal, and hexadecimal maths that is required to examine the details of how computers networks works. This session, along with the second session, Networking Fundamentals, provides an overview of many topics related to computer networking, introduces many terms, and provides a solid foundation before you get into more detailed subjects in a later stage. We may define a network formally as a combination of a computer hardware, cabling, network devices, and computer software used together to allow computers to communicate with each other. So there are four elements to that. Computer hardware, cabling, network devices, and computer software. The diagram uh, is an example of a simple network with two computers and a cable. Although it is terribly not impressive, a network, it does serve a good purpose in real life, as well as being useful for discussing networking and learning some business in classrooms and labs. An example of a major larger network and more interesting is the internet, which is actually a collection of interconnected private and public networks. The internet consists of many large and small networks that are interconnected. Simply speaking, it's a network of networks. Connection to the internet can be broken down into three parts, physical connection, logical connection, and applications connection. What are the requirements for internet connection? A physical connection is made by connecting an adapter card, such as a modem, or a network interface card, NIC, from a PC to a network. So you need to know the meaning of this, or the definition of NIC, network interface card. The physical connection is used to then transfer signals between the PC within the local area network and, and to a remote devices on the internet. Logical connections uses standards, which are also known as protocols. 
A protocol is just a formal description of a set of rules and conventions that would govern how devices on a network would communicate, e.g. your transmission control protocol or TCP IP. The last part of any connection are the application connections or the software programs that interpret and display data in an understandable form. Applications work with protocols to send and receive data across the internet. Examples of applications are web browsers, such as the Internet Explorer, Netscape, Mozilla, etc., Firefox, and so on. Although you need some knowledge of the basis of PCs, is important, you know, this in the course, you do not need detailed knowledge of PCs. In this session, I'll provide some of the basic information that you require. Computers are important building blocks in any network. Many networking devices are special purpose computers. A computer must work properly before it can be used to access information, such as a web-based content. One would need to have some basic ideas on how to troubleshoot basic hardware and software problems on a computer. Some basic components of a PC include a transistor, which is a device that amplifies a signal, or in some instances is looked upon as a switch which opens and closes a circuit. An integrated circuit is a device made of semiconductor material that contains many transistors and performs a specific task. There are different types of integrated circuits, you know. Then there's a resistor, a capacitor. The diagram here shows you some of the basic components of a, of a PC on a, on a board. So you can see a resistor there. You can see a resistor there. This is that, a resistor. You can see the whole thing is an integrated circuit. That's a capacitor there. That's another capacitor there. A transistor, uh, the diagrammatically is shown as that. There's a base of a transmitter. There's a collector. There's a meter. The base here enables this part to be open so that information can flow from here to there. So that then is like a door that it opens or closes. That is why we also call it a switch. Other parts of the component include the central processing unit, the microprocessor, the motherboard, power supply, the network interface card, a video card, audio card, parallel port, serial port, and so on. Let me turn my attention now to the network interface card because it's an important part uh, for the computers to use if you are going to build a network. So for a PC to use a network, it must have some interface to that network. PCs use the network interface cards or the NICs to provide that interface. In fact, the name is somewhat self-descriptive, you know, uh, network interface card. So they are expansion cards that can give a PC an interface to a network. So these are examples of various types of art, network interface cards. When purchasing a network interface card, consider the following features, you know, uh, such as uh, protocols. What does it have? Is it Ethernet, token ring, or FDDI? I must say that FDDI is no longer that popular or it's not widely used. The type of media is going to use, whether it's twisted pair, coaxial, wireless, or fiber optic. The type of bus system, whether it's PCI or ISA. A modern or a modulator demodulator. A modern is a modulator demodulator, a device that provides computers with connectivity to a telephone line. It might be an interesting exercise for you at home to look at. Uh, to look for an Ethernet uh, NIC on your PC. Uh, so when you get home, what I want you to do is take your PC, open the back, and see if you can find the internet, uh, network interface cards. But note that although uh, the NICs can be inserted into a PC's expansion slot, 
many of the newer ones have them integrated you know, onto the motherboard. You need an NIC installed for each device on the network. You use, you use different types of NICs for various devices configurations. You need to perform the installation of NIC or a modem. Uh, you, you may need the following. Knowledge of how the adapter, the jumpers, and the plug and play software are configured. You will need some uh, diagnostic tools. And you may need to be able to resolve hardware conflicts. So far, I have talked about hardware. Software also provides the motivation and the reason why a computer tries to what? Communicate in the first place. You might build a network with computer hardware, NICs, modems, cables, and so on. But if no software exists, the computers do not attempt to communicate. Software provides that logic and that motivation for a computer to communicate. For the computer communication to be useful, the communication must follow a set of rules. Networking rules are formally defined by many netwo uh, different networking standards and networking protocols. The main one is the Transmission Control Protocol first slash internet protocol, or the TCP IP, which is a set of protocols or rules that have been developed to allow computers to share resources across a network. TCP IP can be configured using your operating system. Every network needs to be tested after the setup. As Previously mentioned, the TCP IP consists of a large number of our protocols. In fact, the name TCP IP refers to two of the most popular protocols inside it. The TCP protocol, or the transmission, uh, control, uh, transmission control protocol, and the internet protocol. Because the TCP IP contains a large volume of protocols, it is useful to think about the our the protocols as a suit, as a groups or grouping of its members into categories called layers. The diagram shows you uh, diagrammatically the, the layer model of uh, this uh, protocol. So what you can see in the diagram are, what do you call it, the various layers and the protocols that you can find. So you've got an application layer, yeah, and the protocols there are the HTTP, SMTP, POP3, the transport layer, which is the TCP, UDP, uh, the internet layer, which is got the IP protocol, and the network interface, which has got the Ethernet, frame relay, or point-to-point, -point, you know, and so on. In the TCP IP, you have a command known as a ping command. You, you need to test connectivity for any network. A basic command that you need for this is a ping one. So the ping verifies a particular IP address and to know if it exists and assess requests from it. The acronym, the ping actually is an acronym for Packet Internet or Internetwork Grouper. Uh, the ping command works by sending special internet protocol packets called the Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, echo request datagrams to a specified destination and uh, waits for a response, or it, and a response is echoed back to it. The diagram here shows you the output from a ping command from Packet Tracer. All right, so you, you ping a specific machine. You can see the ping command here, 127.0.0.1, uh, which is actually a loopback ping. You say a little bit about that later. You will need to be able to understand and interpret the information you receive from this ping test. Each packet sent it's a request, when you use a, pick, a ping, the, each packet you send is actually a request for, info, for reply. 
The trace root tool typically, I mean, which trace root, yeah, uh, also helps in this. Uh, is found in many operating systems, and traces the route a packet takes, you know, to a particular destination. The actual name of the command differs depending upon the operating system that you are using. In Microsoft Microsoft operating systems, the actual name is trace set. In Cisco routers, Linux, and Unix, it is called trace route. A number of types of ping commands could be used, you know, as if the diagram we saw earlier was the ping 127.0.0.1. This is a unique ping and it's called an internal loopback test. It is used to verify the TCP IP network configuration. The ping, then there's, you ping an IP address of a host computer. It's a, it's a ping to a host PC which verifies the TCP IP address configuration for that local host and connectivity to that host. You could also ping a default gateway IP address. It's a, a, a ping to the default gate, gate, gateway indicates if the router that connects to that local network, you know, uh, connects the, to other networks can be reached. So you, normally you would have a local gateway through which you uh, assess other networks. So a ping to the default gateway is to verify whether or not you can reach that gateway. And then, of course, the ping of a remote destination IP, which is a ping to a remote destination and verifies the connectivity to a remote host. What are web browsers? Web browser software shows information in the window of a PC's video display. Uh, that information might be a simple test, graphics, video, or animation. Web browsers can also play video. So a web browser is a software that would interpret HTML, which is one of the languages used to code web page contents. So HTML is the most common markup language and can display graphics or play sound, like I've said already. Some of the most popular web browsers today are Internet uh, Explorer, Netscape, Mozilla, Firefox, and so on. Uh, also, you also have a Google Chrome uh, and so on. Netscape Navigator is important because it was the first popular browser. It uses less disk space. It displays HTML files, performs email and file transfers. So, we have looked at some of the basic concepts, you know, underlying networks, some of the basic processes. Now, I want to turn my attention to the, some of the maths that uh, uh, underlines networks. So understanding binary, decimal, and hexadecimal numbering system is important to many aspects of computer networks. Binary numbering, that's base two, is necessary because it represents the most basic uh, operations on computers. So all computers work in the binary system. Uh, Hexadecimal is necessary because using the binary, it's difficult for us humans to reach. And therefore, uh, the base system helps us to easily reach the numbers. Because you can have long strings of zeros and ones, and if you can shorten this, then that would be useful. So, at the most basic level, com computers work with bits. Tr the transistors are components of a chip that can be placed into either an on or an off state. Recall, we said that a transistor is what? A switch. So it can either be an on and off state. The ones and zeros are used to represent the two possible states of an electronic comp uh, component. You could actually be thinking, okay, I mean, could I have done anything else apart from this? Is there any physical device that can be in maybe three, four, or five states? You no, know, it'd be very difficult to find that. The American standard code uh, for information interchange, which is the ASCII code, is the most commonly used to represent the alpha numeric data in a computer. So in the ASCII code, you group a number of what? These ones and zeros to represent a specific letter, alphabet, or number, or, or, and so on. So we have said that computers work with bits, but we can also work with what? Groups of these bits, you know, like a byte, you know, uh, so a group of eight bits is a byte. 
You can also work, talk about what? A word, which is a typically four bytes. That, that constitutes a word. So I've said that we represent these characters and symbols with unique combination of uh, patterns. And the ASCII code is an example. As sometimes we need to convert the binary numbers into hexadecimal uh, numbers. And this conversion is done purely for human understandability, so that we can understand. The aim of the hexadecimal conversion is to reduce a long string of binary digits to a few hexadecimal uh, characters. Uh, it is easier to remember and to work with hexadecimal numbers than with binary numbers. So computers are designed to use groupings of 8 bits. This grouping of 8 bits is referred to as a byte, which I've said already. In a computer, one byte represents a single addressable location in memory. Now, the total number of combinations of the eight switches being turned on and off is what? 256. Uh, the value range will be from 0 to 255. How do you get this? It's 2 to the power of what? The number of bits, 2 to the power of 8. And your two powers table is something you should just know offhand. So if I say what's 2 to the power of 10, you should be able to tell me. It's just like knowing a two times table. So the table you see gives you some of the units, their definition, and uh, examples of it. Let's look at a base 10 number system. We know that our decimal number system is based on 10. So uh, I'm sure you have learned this in primary school about place value. So you have your units, tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on. Each column position of a, uh, 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 from right to left is multiplied by the base number raised to the power, which is an exponent. So if you look at that example, the number 2,134 is actually 2,000 the one hundred, uh, three tens, and four ones. This is what it actually means. So to get that number, you raise it to a, uh, you, you raise the, the position values to a certain power. And since we are working in base 10, the first position will at 10 to the power of zero, multiplied by the number in that position. Similarly, in our base two number system, uh, there are only two symbols, which are zeros and ones. In the base 10 system, we have 10 symbols, 0, 1, 2, 3, and up to 9. But in the base two system, we only have two symbols, 0 and 1. Now, think carefully about this. Why do we use only 0 and 1? What is the limitation? Why can't we use 10? And I've said this earlier on. Uh, 